in my talk, I will look at how the TV series Mad Men engages 50s gender politics through a consciously modern awareness and employs a specific kind of nostalgia that allows the audience a certain, a certain distance from what they see on the screen. I will examine how both nostalgia and the use of melodrama complicate the representations of women and what this means in terms of the show's gender politics. Mad Men premiered in 2007 on the cable network AMC and has been both a critical and commercial success. The series focuses on Don Draper, on the left, uh, the creative director at the Madison Avenue advertising agency Sterling Cooper, and on both his professional and personal life. Uh, he lives in the New York suburbs with his wife Betty, a housewife, and their two children. Mad Men covers the time period between 1960 and 1968, over six, six seasons so far, a seventh season is planned for next year. For the purposes of this presentation, I will limit my analysis to the first season of Mad Men and its 13 episodes, which are set in 1960. I also want to specify that I'm using uh, the notion of the 50s as the cultural construct that refers to the post-war period from about 1948 until the Kennedy assassination in 1963. Mad Men has been received in an overwhelmingly positive way, embraced by audiences and critics alike. Its popularity has led to clothing lines, Barbie dolls, and cookbooks, all inspired by the show and the style of its time period. The show has also been the subject to some criticism, mainly directed at the show's apparent nostalgia towards the 50s, seen as promoting a world of sexism, racism, and homophobia. Daniel Mendelssohn, in particular, um, among other criticism, accuses the show of being melodramatic rather than dramatic, almost a soap opera, as he says, and criticizes, uh, quote, the show's ability to tell us anything of real substance about the world it depicts, end quote. I argue uh, that Mad Men uh, not only engages the 50s, in, not only engages in 50s politics and ideology in a meaningful way, but it does so by way of looking at the 50s with the awareness that any attempt at merely reproducing the actual real 1950s is futile. I argue that Mad Men's conscious use of melodrama and nostalgia for the constructed 50s allows the show to both relish in a consciously fictional and artificial version of that period and to engage gender politics in a critical way. In my talk, I will first introduce the 50s and how this construct came into being, uh, focusing in particular on the, role of the, on the role that the visual aspect played in this process and how nostalgia has developed over the decades. Then I will contextualize Mad Men in relation to the nostalgic discourse for the 50s and the show's awareness of it. And finally, I will look at how the mode of melodrama influences gender representations on the sh in the show. Even though nostalgia in popular culture has been at different times directed towards any past decade, there is something about the 50s that has facilitated the development of a particularly strong fascination. By being the first decade visually reproduced on a mass scale through television, the 1950s played a crucial role in the process of creating their own mythology. Even more than films, the popularity of TV shows like I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, and Leave It to Beaver contributed to the shaping and the construction of the 50s as they were still being experienced. These shows in particular contributed to the crystallizing of the ideal American family and have helped solidifying the traditional gender roles that see men working in the public sphere and women at home confined to the domestic one. The construct of the 50s as an idealized decade um, has established itself in the American popular imagination through decades of films and TV series reproducing it as the ultimate time, ultimate time period of wealth, hope, and overall well-being in American history. The 1970s and 1980s in particular have been characterized by a number of texts fascinated with the idea of recapturing and glorifying that time. Films like American Graffiti, Back to the Future, and Diner, and the TV show Happy Days uh, portray the 50s through a nostalgic lens that tends to forget or consciously omit aspects such as poverty, political unrest, and, and, and racial and sexual discrimination in favor of more positive and untroubled representation that typically center on white, middle-class, heterosexual men. In line with the 1950s sitcoms just mentioned, these films accentuate the importance of the traditional families, family for the 50s and consequently of the gender roles that come with it. More recently, an interest in the 1950s has resurfaced in popular culture. Texts from the last two decades have managed to engage the 50s more critically abandoning the unquestioned look of nostalgia towards that allegedly perfect decade of American history in favor of a more ambivalent representations, particularly in terms of gender roles and gender relations. 
In these more recent representations of the 50s, there seems to be a common fascination with the aesthetics of that time, which results in visually appealing images characterized by bright colors, soft focus lenses that heighten the carefully decorated sets and beautifully dressed actors. Mad Men has been considerably praised for its accuracy in terms of clothing, furniture, and general care in reproducing the style of the 50s, and it is an aspect the show is actively concerned with. Though the show's attention to the visual details of the period has been hailed as authentic by many critics, on screen it also translates as extremely artificial looking and quite focused on the style of the time. So much so that even the actors often seem to function merely as part of a set, as just another piece of furniture, as we can see, for example, in the many shots of characters just sitting and smoking, looking stylish. I feel you nodding. <laughs> um, all the effort put into accurately reproducing the past results in artificial and staged-looking visuals that inevitably recall previously, previous fictional representation of the 50s rather than the real 1950s. Madman seems to be quite conscious of the processes at work and of the history of nostalgia for the 50s. Consequently, I argue, the show, by consciously portraying the 50s as a copy of a copy, doesn't, glori doesn't glorify that time. Rather, through calling attention to the artificial nature of this construct, it embraces it as such, in a pro process I refer to as self-reflexive nostalgia, and consciously longs for something that was never real in the first place. Madman employs its nostalgic outlook in a conscious way, as it is evi evident in different moments throughout the show. For example, the show features often pregnant women smoking and drinking alcohol, children playing with plastic bags over their heads, <laughs> men smoking excessively and drinking alcohol in the workplace, often in the morning. Similarly, with its casual inclusion of racism and sexism, and the way the show plays with historical events, Medwin is trying to appeal to the spectator's knowledge and in a way sense of superiority as they supposedly know better. At the same time, by explicitly pointing at all the aspects one tends to omit in a nostalgic haze, Madman is also aware that these 50s are nothing but a fantasy. By knowingly winking at its audience, the show keeps drawing attention to the fictional nature of what is represented, constantly reminding the audience that they are watching a TV show about the past from today's perspective. In order to show Madman's self-reflective nostalgia at work even more explicitly, I want to look at the crucial moment towards the end of the final episode of the first season. Don, as the creative director of the agency, is in charge of the new ad campaign for a new Kodak slide projector called The Wheel. For his presentation, Don has put together a series of pictures from his family life for the clients and accompanies them with these words. In Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a twinge in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. This device isn't a spaceship, it's a time machine. It goes backwards, forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. It's not called the wheel, it's called the carousel. It lets us travel the way a child travels, around and around and back home again, to a place where we know we are loved. Instead of focusing on the technological improvement of the product, as the client suggested, Don appeals to their sense of nostalgia. The whole sequence is sentimental, quite melodramatic, and plays with the spectator's emotions. At this point in the show, Don and Betty's marriage is far from perfect. Don has been cheating on her since the first episode, and Betty has, has just found out that Don has been communicated with her, with her therapist. Not only Don's life is far, far from the version he's trying to sell to the clients, but the gesture of longing for happier times, times is a comment on them being nothing more than a fantasy. Even though the audience doesn't know if Don and Betty were ever as happy as they look in the slides, it ultimately doesn't matter. Don believes that these images are real, and so does the audience. In a self-reflexive gesture with this sequence, Madman is also addressing both the show's and the viewer's nostalgia for the 50s reproduced on screen. After the presentation, in the final moments of the, episodes, um, of the episode, anxious to reclaim his place within his family, Don rides the train home and joins Betty and the kids before they leave for Thanksgiving dinner. However, what we see is nothing more than Don's fantasy. In fact, the series shows us the same scene again, but this time we see what actually happens. Don is too late. Betty and the kids have already left, and he sits down on the stairs in the dark and alone. His desire of finally being with his wife and children seems to stem from the nostalgic idea of his family that he has presented to the clients, an image manufactured by Don himself in order to sell a product. 
Regardless of how real this nostalgia might be, it works for Don and by extension for the audience as well. By having Don believe his own pitch, Madman comments both on the process of manufacturing nostalgia for something that may as well never really existed, and on, on the fact that it is irrelevant if the object of nostalgia is real or not. The pitch scene, along with many others in Mad Men, emphasizes a propensity for the melodramatic mode, which can be recognized by a certain aesthetic and preoccupation with the mise-en-scene, as, well as, as well as with the way it deals with gender politics of the 50s. Melodrama is usually centered around a, female tragic, a tragic female heroine who attempts to rebel or escape the oppressive patriarchy of her surroundings, but is ultimately punished for it, or just fails. Thomas L. Sessa, in a seminal essay about melodrama, points to the crucial importance of mise en scène in the sublimation of dramatic conflict and in the character's emotional psychological struggles. Melodram melodrama is also characterized by the use of emotional music, overly dramatic actors' performances, and an overall excess in the dramatization of the story on screen. Whereas in drama, characters tend to drive the narrative, in melodrama, in melodrama generally characters merely react to events or they don't do much, as it was pointed out um, <laughs> earlier. Melodrama in Mad Men is mostly at work uh, in the home environment, particularly when the show deals with Don and Betty's marriage. Though most of the show is centered on a male figure, Don's wife Betty is often the focus of the suburban storylines. Betty Draper is quite a typically 19, typical 1950s housewife. She spends most of her time taking care of the house with the help of their African-American maid, Carla, serving dinner, shopping, looking after the children. By observing Betty, it becomes quite clear that the show is familiar with Betty Friedan's problem with no name and bases almost her entire characterization on the idea of the victimized and unhappy 1950s housewife. Mad Men not only draws attention to the traditional 50s gender roles, but also allows the audience to relish in them. In fact, despite Betty's oppressed position, the show is still mostly focalized through Dawn, which makes it harder for the audience to sympathize with Betty. Ultimately, through the historical distance and the use of melodramatic mode, um, the portrayal of gender and ideology in Mad Men is characterized by a certain awareness that enables the critique of 50s gender politics, while at the same time, allows the audience to safely enjoy the sexism, oppression, and the overall troubling way women are treated on the show. As an example from Mad Men, I want to turn to the main storyline of episode nine, and how both the self-reflexive aspect of nostalgia and the melodramatic mode influence the portrayal of gender politics. Betty, uh, who used to work as a model before she met and married Don, is cast in the new Coca-Cola ad by a competitor of Sterling Cooper. The set of the ad is a family picnic scene with a couple and their children. The image of the picture-perfect family appears as a very typical 50s ad, staged and unnatural looking. Overload of bright colors, big, sm big smiles, and an overall sense of artifice. The style of the setup works as a reference to old 50s ads, as they reproduce highly constructed images of happy people enjoying the products advertised, and melodramatically foregrounds the mise-en-scene over the narrative. Mad Men, by including an image that is so obviously unreal, is exposing the artifice behind the process of advertising, as the show often does, but more importantly, is again self-reflexively commenting on its own fictionality. The resulting photographs draw attention to their constructedness, which in turn reminds the viewer that those 50s are not real and neither are the 50s Mad Men is reproducing. Even more so, it stands for Betty's fantasy. It's her way of escaping the domestic sphere, which, in line with the conventions of melodrama, will eventually fail. At first, when Betty mentions the offer to audition for the ad, Don wonders why Betty wants to work, but doesn't try to stop her, being surprisingly supportive instead. What Betty doesn't know, and Don does, is that the agency representing Coca-Cola, McKenna Erickson, hires Betty as their model because they're trying to hire Don. When Don opts for staying at his current firm, McCann decides against using the photographs they shot with Betty, justifying, justifying it as a creative choice. Don never tells Betty about the job offer, nor about the fact that McCann is using her to get to him. As the episode continues, it becomes even clearer that Don had never had, n never had any intention to leave his current job. He only wanted to test McCann and see what he would do in order to get him. By letting his wife work, he's merely using her to appease his sense of flattery and even vanity. If on the one hand, Don appears, at least on the surface, quite modern in allowing his wife to work outside the, of the domestic sphere, on the other hand, he ultimately fits the role of a 50s husband perfectly, 
At dinner, after being fired, Betty tells Dawn that she doesn't want to work anymore, and she's perfectly happy being a housewife and a mother. Betty's quite proud and doesn't want to admit that she has been rejected, and that's why she doesn't want to work anymore. Dawn, instead of revealing that he is the reason she was fired, is satisfied with the end result of Betty returning to the domestic sphere and tells her, quote, Birdie, you know I don't care about making my dinner or taking in my shirts. You have a job. You're mother to those two little people, and you're better at it than anyone else in the world. End of quote. Interestingly, Dawn separates the notion of being a housewife from being a mother, and Betty seems, to, seems happy to accept her role with renewed satisfaction. The next day, we see Betty happily making breakfast for the kids, doing laundry, and taking care of the house. By having her back in the domestic sphere, Madman seems to fully embrace 50s traditional and conservative gender politics. However, the final scene of the episode also seems to indicate something else. Betty, still in her nightgown, goes outside in the yard and starts shooting, starts shooting at the neighbor's pigeons with a BB rifle. In this scene, Betty, who is often called Birdie by Don, lets out her frustration in a final act of rebellion. I would argue that she's surrendering to her life in a domestic cage and therefore shoots the birds, which are kept in captivity, to put them out of their misery. In this way, Madman is not only commenting on Betty's unhappiness as a 50s suburban housewife, but, and by extension on 50s gender roles, but is also allowing the audience to still embrace such gender politics as being part of this fictional 50s. As I've discussed, uh, Madman offers a complicated portrayal of 50s gender politics by employing a more critical approach than earlier films about that time, but it also limits its engagement with certain issues by recurring to a self-reflexive use of nostalgia that encourages to look at the 50 as merely constructed and fictional, as a merely constructed and fictional decade. Nonetheless, the show still reflects on issues of gender inequality and oppression by way of this nostalgia, as it allows the audience to safely enjoy past sexism from a distance while questioning how things have changed since then. Thank you. <laughs>